Perhaps you've heard the phrase, practice makes Well, in music, we have a phrase, practice makes permanent. And in worship, you'll notice often, we'll repeat phrases. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Uh, In Christ alone. And the reason why, practice makes permanent. We're also, before each sermon this uh, series, reading the uh, Beatitudes together. Why? Practice makes permanent. So let's read this together as it begins to saturate us and as we begin to learn what it means to be a kingdom citizen. I'll go first. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Let's be seated. We are in this series called Up, uh, Kingdom Citizens, looking at the upside down kingdom. That's what the, the image there even means, that the kingdom of God doesn't operate the way the kingdoms of this world operate. Um, and sometimes the Beatitudes, which are, if you don't know, these are the uh, introductory statements to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. These eight statements of blessing. Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. We just read them. And the word blessed in, is in Greek is makarios. It means uh, fortunate, happy, lucky, congratulations. Which, when you think of it and read what Jesus is saying, at first hearing, maybe at second and third and fourth hearing, it doesn't, it sounds incongruous. Meek, mourning, poor in spirit, how are those people blessed? It certainly doesn't make sense in our culture. And I, we have been wrestling with what does this mean for us really? As a matter of fact, our preaching team, several of us on the preaching team were away at a theology conference just this week and debating, uh, well, how are we rightly to understand these? How are we going to teach exactly what what these are? Are these entrance requirements to the kingdom? Are these commands we have to obey? Like, what really are we learning here in these Beatitudes, and how do we communicate them? And I think it has everything to do with the perspective through which we hear them and see them. It's a matter of perspective. In the first week, John Dixon told us that the Beatitudes are about the kingdom, they're about Jesus, and they're about grace. And so we need to see them from that perspective. But we need help to shift our perspective. I'm going to show you an image on the screen here to help talk about this perspective idea. It's just a nice image of a pretty, I don't know if it's not that nice of an image, actually. Just concrete <laughs> next to the water, you know, pretty nothing going on there. How many of you heard of the German street artist named Edgar Miller? Edgar Miller does, a, a, you can YouTube him, do that after the sermon. Uh, and he does uh, street art all over the world. Amazing pieces. And you can watch him create these things on, on just kind of nondescript pieces of pavement like this one. Here's the exact same shot after he's finished. Yeah. Wow. And you can watch him create this. It's amazing. They're, they're, he does stunning works of art all over the place in the kind of just regular pieces of pavement. Now, here's the thing. This only, I heard your gasp. Uh, this only goes, oh, you only feel that way if you're standing in the right spot. If you move a few feet to the right or the left, it doesn't look the same. If you move six feet right or left, it looks like nothing. Just kind of blue and white paint on, on, the, on the sidewalk. Only if you're standing in the right spot do you go, whoa. And you see it in its beauty and how amazing it is. I think the Beatitudes work that way. It's, if you're not seeing them from the right spot, you can miss them. Like, huh? I don't really get that. Some stuff Jesus says that I don't understand. Add it to the list of strange things in the Bible. But if you're seeing it from the right perspective, you go, whoa, I see it now. I see what the kingdom is now. And I think we have, to, we have to have the right perspective to get it. And the perspective is a kingdom perspective. 
I was married in 1993, and, uh, and in that year was also the year that the great movie Braveheart came out. I love that movie. Anybody seen Braveheart? I know it dates me quite a bit, but that's not surprising. Anyway, uh, when Mel Gibson's in that movie, and he plays William Wallace, the Scottish freedom fighter uh, of the 13th century, and there's a scene where the Scottish nobles are fighting over allegiance to the English crown and so on, and, and they want William Wallace to acquiesce to their demands, and he says, there's a difference between us. You think the people of this country exist to provide you with position and power. I think your position exists to provide them with freedom, and I go to see that they have it. Anyway, <laughs> you can tell I like that movie a little bit. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> The, the, the point there is, all the kingdoms of the world operate on this, on this principle. Political kingdoms, empires, nations today, all of you for me. We're in election season, and that's how it works, right? All of you for me. We, the, 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 your vote, your support for me. The kingdom of God is exactly the opposite. Jesus says, me for all of you. I give my life for all of you. He's not looking for your vote. He gave his life. It's a completely upside-down kingdom, and we have to see it that way. And this is Jesus' main theme, the blessings of the kingdom. So let's rewind the tape a little bit, look at this idea of the kingdom, going back to the prophet Isaiah. 700 years before Jesus uh, walked the earth, Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4, this is the prophet speaking of the words of God to the people in captivity longing to be restored. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow beauty on them, a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise Instead of a spirit of despair, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Looking forward to the future, Isaiah says, God is going to restore you, Israel. Now, they understood that politically, nationally, and that was, that was their hope, but we see through it to the ultimate hope realized in Jesus. Because when Jesus comes on the scene in Luke chapter 4, by the way, he goes, he's in his hometown of Nazareth and he goes to his home synagogue. How many of you have ever been back to your, like, your home church? The church you grew up in? You ever go back to your home church? Years ago when I was a pastor, uh, I, I went to my home church to see Mrs. Kingston, who was my Sunday school teacher. And uh, she kicked me out of Sunday school class when I was in fifth grade. You didn't know that, but now I'm telling you. Oh, for, for fighting with Steve Rossborough over NFL pencils, uh, I got kicked out of Sunday school class because we got pencils for memorizing verses. This is a whole story. It's not part of the sermon. Anyway, and I saw her and she said, I always knew you'd be a pastor. I'm like, what? You kicked me out of Sunday school. How did you know? So Jesus in his home synagogue in Nazareth, the town he grew up in, everybody knew him as Joseph's boy. And here's what happens. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The ultimate mic drop moment in his home synagogue, right? All that you have been longing for and hoping for and waiting for is now here. Boom. The king has arrived. And we live in this already but not yet reality of the kingdom. The kingdom has come in Jesus because the king has come. But it's not yet fully realized. Now with that as a background, let's, let's look again at Matthew 5, 1 through 10. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them and he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst 
for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I said a minute ago, there's an already but not yet reality to the kingdom. It's a present reality and a future hope. Because when you read this list, do the meek always inherit the earth today? Are the meek always promoted? Do the meek get elected? No. You should be going, no, they don't. Are the merciful always shown mercy? No, they get walked on sometimes. Do the peacemakers always make peace? Not presently in Israel or in Gaza or in Ukraine or in Lebanon or all over the world. So we see glimpses of the kingdom, but it's not fully realized. It's already but not yet. And Jesus comes and says, these upside down blessings. How are we to understand these blessings? Let me go back a couple of slides. I missed this one. A quote from Vaughn Roberts. If we can go back. Sorry, that's my fault. <laughs> Boom. The Beatitudes are not about high ideals that we must live up to, but about God's gracious deliverance available to all, even the lowest and least likely, and our joyous participation in his upside down kingdom. So these are not commands you have to obey or ideals you have to live up to. These are God's declared promises of blessing to all people, especially those that would seem like on the outside in our culture. And they're an invitation to all of us to live his upside down kingdom way. All right, thanks for staying with me there. I wanna show you four realities about mourning from a kingdom perspective. Because we're looking at mourning. Blessed are those who mourn. And uh, this really goes with the first one last week, blessed are the poor in spirit. They should have gone together, but that would have ruined our schedule, so we broke them apart. Blessed are those who mourn, for they, for they will be comforted. I'm going to show you four things about mourning. First, mourning is inevitable. Job says that man and women, we or human beings, are born for trouble and sorrow as sure as sparks fly upward. You, you live on earth long enough, and you have reason to mourn. You just do. I don't have to tell you that. And if it hasn't come to you yet, hang in there. We have reason to mourn loss of those we love, loss of a dream, loss of a marriage, pain, sorrow, failure. For all of us, mourning is inevitable. C.S. Lewis, who's not on the screen, but he has to be in the sermon. <laughs> he doesn't have to be. He says in his book, A Grief Observed, which by the way, if you have a friend who's struggling with grief, this is a great gift to give them, this little book he wrote in the wake of the death of his wife's uh, death to cancer. Um, he writes, we're promised sufferings in this life. They're part of the program. We were even told, blessed are those that mourn, and I accept it. I've got nothing that I hadn't bargained for. Of course, it is a different thing when it happens to yourself and not to others, in reality, not in theory. Mourning is inevitable. The writer of Ecclesiastes, who's making observations about the reality of life, puts it this way. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. I often will read this at the outset of funerals because I think one of the hardest things about being a person on planet Earth is knowing what time it is knowing what season it is in our lives, especially when it's a season we don't want and didn't look for and, don't, and feels painful to us. We tend in our culture to deny or diminish mourning. We're not good at it. We don't like it. We want to get right through it. I think many Christians think, I can't really worship or serve God until I get to the other side of this sadness, this sorrow, this mourning. And that's not true. That's not the witness of Scripture. We're in a hurry to either get past it or deny it altogether. And I think we suffer because of that. We're diminished because of that. 
In many, have you noticed in some cultures, both in, in the ancient world and today, different than our culture, there's a period of mourning set aside? They, they set aside a time, a designated time, often 40 days, which is biblical, but we don't have time to dig into all that. A, a season of mourning, a period of mourning. It's not over yet, in other words. They understand intuitively that it takes time. You can't rush through this. And God is doing something even in the valley. I, my observation as a pastor is, let's just take mourning over loss, over death, is that we do it such an unhelpful way. You're the family that has experienced loss, and you have to make a thousand decisions about caskets and flowers and funeral arrangements, and your world is upside down, and you don't know how to decide these things. And then all your friends and family come into town, and you have to figure out how to take care of them. And then we have a service that you barely are even present for because your world is just, you're aching inside. And then we have a burial and a luncheon, and people go back to their lives, and then you're, now what? I don't think that's helpful. I think we need to stay in it with each other to rush through it, to pretend we're okay when we aren't. The Ecclesiastes writer, which is Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, making observations about life, says something in chapter 7 that's, that it, to most American ears sounds crazy. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth? How many of you think that's true? We love a birth, newborn baby. Celebrate. Party. How could the day of death be better than the day of birth? It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Everything about that sounds backwards. Doesn't make sense, but here's what he's saying in brief. The end of a thing has more to teach us than the beginning of a thing, often. The ending has wisdom and perspective to impart to us more than the beginning. That we see what life, what really matters in life, often at the end of it than at the beginning. Isn't that true? And we shouldn't be afraid of it, though it's painful and hard. There's something in it for us. Which doesn't mean that it's good to be sad all the time but there can be blessing in it. I'll put it this way. We grow by paying careful attention to God and staying in those things which we would much rather avoid. Has that been true in your life? It's been profoundly true in mine. We grow, we deepen by staying present and paying attention to God in things we would otherwise much rather avoid. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And part of that comfort is learning the lesson, the wisdom, in the midst of the pain, in the depths of the valley. Second, uh, mourning is spiritual. Mourning is a spiritual lesson. It's not primarily about material, physical loss of life, although it, it is about that but it's not even fundamentally about that. It doesn't start there. At its deepest level, it's spiritual in nature. Those who mourn is not just referring to our grief in the face of physical death. Mourning is the language of exile in the Old Testament. Some of you know the story of Israel. They, had, they were in exile precisely because of their sin and rebellion against God. They were disconnected from him, and they, there were real consequences for their sin. So mourning is fundamentally about the brokenness and the consequences of human sin. The oppression, the injustice, the violence, the disease, the death, the disasters, that all are a result of the brokenness of the world, which if you trace it back far enough to Genesis chapter 3, it's our rejection and rebellion against God. You read Genesis 3, and it's not just that Adam and Eve got what was coming to them. It's, there was a cosmic shift that took place. The world was, was broken in that sense of, of sinfulness that's in all of us. And this is not a culturally popular message. But if you read Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul talks about a groaning that's going on. He says, creation groans to be set right. And he says, we too groan inwardly. We long 
for it to be different than it is. I, I don't know about your experience, but I grow numb to it sometimes. It's just so much information coming at us all day, every day about the pain of the world that it's easy to just kind of, you know, you just can't, you can't swallow it all. But every now and then, something gets through. Like you see an image of, of a father running from a, a burning building from a bomb, carrying his child. I don't know if he's Palestinian or Israeli. It doesn't even matter. Just a dad carrying a wounded child. The world's broken. A man came up to me after last service and said, I've lost 60 members of my family to the war in Gaza. I'm a Palestinian Christian. My family are all Muslims. I'm the only Christian. And 60, 60 have died. What is blessed are those who mourn mean to him. So it is about the brokenness of the world because of sin, but even deeper still, it's about the brokenness because of my sin, my brokenness, and yours. Mourning over your sin, over your inability to live the way God intended. In a sense, mourning is the emotional counterpart to poor in spirit. Because poverty of spirit, we learned last week, is, is to recognize that I'm spiritually bankrupt before God. I have nothing to bring to him. I'm wholly dependent on his grace. And that's not just an intellectual exercise. There's an emotional response to that of sorrow and grief and mourning. I'll put it this way. The poor in spirit know they have a sin problem and they mourn over it. The poor in spirit know the world has a sin problem and they mourn over it. Mourning is really the only truly Christian response to sin and suffering, the first one, the first right one. And we're told they will be comforted. But what's the comfort? I know ultimately someday Jesus is going to come back, but what's the comfort offered to us in our mourning? There's an interesting place in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. The Apostle Paul has wrote two letters to a church in Corinth in modern-day Greece, and uh, by the way, have you ever heard people say things like, hey, the early church, they, we got to get back to the early church. They were, they were pure and faithful to God, and, and we have, we're, we've lost our way. We've got to get back to the early church. If you think that's true, read 1 Corinthians, because they were a hot mess. And so that kind of encourages me, because we are too, a little bit. Anyway, um, Paul has written them two letters. Pro and, and, and here in the second letter, he's referencing a letter he wrote, which is probably not 1 Corinthians. It means he's, he wrote a, a different letter, and this letter was to rebuke them chastise them, call out their sin and brokenness and willingness to follow false teachers. And he didn't want to have to write it. It grieved Paul to write it, but he wrote it because he loved them enough to tell them the truth. Here, here's the part in 2 Corinthians. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. You heard he says, I didn't want to have to do it, but I did it because I love you. For I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. How good is that? Whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you've proved yourselves innocent in the matter. In other words, Paul's saying, look, you, were, you had lost your way. You're, I was so serious, I had to confront you about it. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to hurt your feelings. I knew it would grieve you, but I did it because I love you. And I'm so thankful that God got through to you, that your grief and sorrow and mourning over your sin led to a repentance that has produced salvation without regret. The brokenhearted, to be brokenhearted over our own sin is the first step toward receiving the comfort God offers, which is salvation in Christ, forgiveness, freedom, liberation. You know the story of old Simeon in, the, in, the New, in Luke chapter two? He, he's the man, uh, the old man who sees boy Jesus. Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to dedicate him in the temple. Maybe you know this story. If you don't, I'm going to tell you. Simeon, I like to imagine Simeon as like a crazy old man with a long beard, and all the kids made fun of that old religious nut who hung out at the temple all day. That's not in the Bible, but that's in my head. Anyway, they bring Jesus to dedicate him to the temple. 
And Simeon, we're told, is waiting for the consolation of Israel. Consolation is another word for comfort. He's waiting for the comfort of God's salvation, to be able to see God's deliverance. And he's basically like, he's, he's near death, and he's basically said to the Lord, Lord, just let me hang on long enough to see that it's true, that you're gonna make good on your promise. And then one day, this peasant, this, Mary and Joseph are just above the poverty line. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And they bring Jesus to dedicate him. They can barely afford the two doves, the lowest amount you could pay for a sacrifice. And the Spirit of God allows Simeon to see this little boy and go, that's him. There it is. And he has to hold the child. And he holds the boy Jesus. And he says, now, Lord, your servant can depart in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, a glory, light to the nations. What is the, con- he's waiting for the comfort of God. What is it that he gets? What do his eyes see? This is the church answer. You can say this one word and almost always be right. Jesus, right? Jesus. Here's the point. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. What is the consolation? What is the comfort that we receive? It is him. It's not there, there, it's all gonna be okay. Religious platitudes. It is the person of Jesus Christ. It is knowing that my sin is paid for. It is knowing that eternity is secure. It is his presence with me now. The comfort God offers is his son Jesus to his people. Simeon saw it. And Jesus says, that's promised. That's a sure thing. You have him now. And he will have you for all eternity. This brings us to the third lesson. Mourning is temporary. It doesn't always feel temporary, but it's temporary. If one temptation is to make our mourning minimized or ignore it, or get through it or rush past it, the other is to make it ultimate. And some of you know what this is like. When you're in the pit, and it feels like the sadness you feel, the grief you feel, colors everything. Uh, You can't, it's all of life is like uh, seeing through dark, out of focus glasses, because you're Sad, all the time. And it doesn't feel like it's ever gonna pass. And you can't really even imagine being happy or joyful or laughing. In fact, when you get a little moment of, of joy, you almost feel guilty for having it. Have you been there? Anybody? The witness of scripture is though it feels ultimate, it isn't. It isn't. We don't have to get to the other side of our mourning to trust God and to worship God. We can do it in the midst of the valley. There are so many places in Scripture that speak to this, but one of my favorites is just a single psalm, Psalm 30, which has been so meaningful to me in, well, for many years, but in particular this past year. I'm just going to read it. Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol. You've restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. That's the voice of the proud person right there, right? But your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. I love that last part. Turned mourning into dancing. When you're in the midst of mourning, dancing seems like it's an impossibility and it's never gonna come. But the psalmist is saying, what what you feel and experience in the moment is not permanent. God can and does and will turn mourning into dancing and remove sackcloth. That sackcloth is the, is the, it's the 
more grief clothes and clothe you with gladness. The witness of Scripture is that mourning over great loss, over the brokenness of the world, and over our own sin is not the last word. Blessed are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. This is the last point about mourning. Comfort is coming. Comfort is coming. This is the blessing of God's comfort promised to us. It's promised in the past. It's present with us now. And it's going to be realized fully in the future. Let's walk through three passages that outline this. First, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. Again, the prophet writing about the comfort that is promised. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low, and the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Now you might read that and go, I kind of like mountains. That doesn't sound good. I don't want plains forever. It's not physical. It's talking about the, the jagged, rough, difficult terrain of this life, which is painful and hard, is going to be made perfect and smooth one day. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Comfort my people, he will one day do it. And I, honestly, I really think that what this means for us, is the same thing it meant for the ancient Israelites, is that in the midst of the valley now, I hold on to that promise. Knowing it's going to be true can help me in moments when I don't feel it. It holds you when you're in the valley. To know that somewhere, Underneath the rubble of it all, way down deep is a blessing, a promise of comfort that holds you. And you have to dig through some rubble to get to it sometimes. But it's there, nevertheless. Okay, but what about comfort now? What about right now? How can we receive and give comfort that God gives? The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians writes about this in chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. You hear what he's saying? God has given you his comfort. And Jesus said, I'm going away and the comforter will come, the Holy Spirit. He gives you his comfort, the presence of his spirit, the gift of his son. And then you, because you've been comforted that way, get to give that to other people in the same fashion. I don't know if you're getting this. Based on your blank stares, I think you're not. Let me try to explain this. How many of you have ever had somebody come alongside you when you were really hurting, full of sorrow and grief and mourning, and speak exactly the right thing to you? Or say nothing at all and just sit with you, and it was, it was just what you needed at the right time. That ever happened to you? You think that's coincidence? That's the comfort of God. You know the story of Job? Job has unimaginable loss. He's sitting in an ash heap, scratching sores on his body with broken pieces of pottery. Like there's not a more pitiful picture of a person in all of Scripture. And his three friends show up. And for a week, they just sit with him in the ashes. They don't say a word. And then they start talking, and it gets really bad from there. But just for a week, they're really good, because they just sit with him. What this means is, when you have a friend, someone that you care about, and they are in the midst of mourning and sorrow and pain, and you move toward them, not away from them, I think it's so easy to move away. We're sort of conditioned to do it. Well, I don't want to be a bother. Well, I don't know what to say the wrong thing. Well, they probably have plenty of friends, or I don't want to, they don't need one more thing, so we, we, we move away. And it's the wrong thing to do. How many of you say things like, please, please, ask, I'll do anything, just make sure you reach out if you need something. But the person in the midst of the pit doesn't know what they need. So we move toward them, and you point them to the promise of Scripture. You pray with them or for them. You just put your arm around them and say, I'm so sorry. You weep with them. You are offering the comfort of God. You are doing for them what God does for all of us. 
And conversely, if you don't do that, you might be withholding the very comfort God wants to give them. How have you been on the receiving end of that? I have, by many of you. What a great gift and privilege that we get to do that for one another. But that is temporary comfort. Finally, we're told that there is an ultimate comfort coming. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. We read this all the time, and I hope you never get tired of hearing it. This, is, uh, this passage is... Because the way the Christian heart is supposed to work is that the, the certainty of the future in Christ is to run backwards through history into our hearts so that I can live as a kingdom citizen now because of what I know to be true runs backward and fills me now with hope and comfort and joy. It's not just some pie in the sky thing that I, you know, it's not like me saying, I hope the Bears finally, they win today against the Rams. That is not filling me with joy. I have a lot of trepidation about that, right? It's not running into my heart now. I'm like, eh, probably not. But as a Christian, I know I know he's risen. I know he reigns. I know he's forgiven me. I know he's paid for it all. I know he's on the throne. And I don't care what the world says or how it feels in election season. I know it. And even when when I'm down in the pit, I need some of you to come along and tell me, hey, don't forget. This is an ultimate. This is the end of the story. He hasn't abandoned you. And we do that for each other. And that fills us with hope because this is true. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, behold just means look, 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 do you see it? The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. One day, that will be true. And in this day, we live as if it is true. And we tell each other that truth. Because everything else in the world is telling us it isn't true. That's what it means to be a kingdom citizen. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You know who's taught me the most, well, not the most, but a lot about the lessons in mourning, the blessings of mourning? Some of our masterpiece families, moms and dads with kids with disabilities. Because when your son or daughter is born with disabilities, there is a bit of a mourning at first. Sorrow, shock, sadness of the challenges. But then there's so much joy, so much wisdom, so much hope. So much beauty and goodness that comes through those families and those children. Blessed are those who mourn. It's okay to mourn. It's sometimes even good to mourn because we will be comforted. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are our king and we, are, we long to be good citizens of your kingdom. But we just uh, struggle to see it the way you see it. We need your kingdom perspective. And we confess that we lose sight and we get distracted. And so we thank you for your word which breaks through the, uh, the clouds and misperceptions of our minds and hearts. And we see again who you really are, what really matters in this life, what truth is, what's really real. And the world is full of pain. And you see and and mourn it all. Help us to weep over what you weep over, Lord. To feel what you feel. Including our own sin. And to receive, once again, the comfort you offer. Which is yourself. Your forgiveness. Your presence. And the hope of your return. For this we give you praise. And glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. And blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. May you receive the comfort that he offers you in his Son. To him be glory now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.